Thank you very much, Arun. Uh, it was a very profitable morning for me to come here because it seems that I have received an honorary doctoral degree from this institution. I am not uh, Dr. Pendlebury, I'm just David. Uh, but thank you anyway for thinking of me. Um, <clears throat> I'm very honored to be back here. My last visit was five years ago. Uh, I'm honored to be able to speak at this institution so well known around the world. I'm honored to share a platform with Professor Balaram, whose essays I enjoyed reading for many years. Whatever the topic or the issue, he seemed to come right to the nub of the problem with uh, clear thinking, uh, elegant language, and uh, erudition. And I'm very honored also to be talking about Jean Garfield, who was my mentor and friend. As the theme, I chose the idea of world brain because it came up a lot in Jean's thinking, in his writings, and in his artwork. Uh, I think it's an appropriate metaphor, I think he did too, for what his life work was all about. And I've called him a pragmatic polymath, and I hope that some of the comments that I make as I go through these slides will convince you that he was both. You may know that in mid-September, we held a two-day memorial commemoration and celebration for Jean. Jean passed away in late February of this year. He was 91 years old. He had been having some health problems in December and January. He was undergoing some rehabilitation and headed home. Unfortunately, he never made it. Um, there were wonderful tributes uh, after his passing. Uh, the top one is by Arun himself in Current Science. There was another excellent one in uh, Nature by Paul Wouters of Leiden University. And there was a wonderful uh, write-up profile obituary in Frontline by Professor Balaram. And I want you two gentlemen to know that Jean's wife, Meher, who maybe some of you don't know, was raised in Mumbai, uh, appreciated those two obituaries very much. So to begin, uh, I'd like to take you back to the house that Gene Garfield built. Uh, in 1979, this is the headquarters of the Institute for Scientific Information. Now, he started ISI in 1960, and it occupied various buildings, rented spaces, until it grew so large that he decided to build, it was necessary really to build uh, uh, a structure meant for the business or designed for the business. A very attractive building uh, designed by a very well-known architect. Uh, sometimes people have asked me about the, the design on the front of the building. Uh, if you go back to one of Gene's very earliest papers on mechanical indexing using a punch card system, you may get an idea about the inspiration for the design of the facade of this building. Uh, this is the entrance to the building. I used to go in here uh, more than 20 years through these doors. Many other people did who visited ISI. The building was 130,000 square feet. It still is. Open office design, uh, one of the what I used to call the treasury where the journal stacks, where at any time you could go get any journal you wanted. That was a wonderful uh, resource to have. And this is where we did the data processing too, so it had a mainframe computer room. And I guess um, the number of employees here was uh, about 600. Now as you go into the um, foyer of this building, or it used to be this way, um, you would see artwork, a lot of artwork, as Arun mentioned, and uh, pride of place in the entrance to this building was a work of art called World Brain. And it was a, the first holographic engraving done on steel plates. So it, it was a work of art executed with light. Um, <clears throat> now, World Brain. <laughs> Why did Gene 
decide to put a piece of art called World Brain in the entrance to his building. It meant a lot to him. In 1938, H.G. Wells published a series of essays, and the title of the book was World Brain. And here, as Jean describes one of the essay's contents, Wells argued for sweeping reforms in the process by which we bring our accumulated knowledge to bear on social, economic, and political affairs. He envisioned a world encyclopedia in which multidisciplinary research information of a global nature would be gathered together and made available for the immediate use of anyone in the world. A very comprehensive idea of uh, the future. Uh, so Wells really, uh, in many of his writings, was perceived as a writer of science fiction, but uh, one with great imagination about possibilities, perhaps, of science fact. Now, if you enter a person's home, whether it's their entryway or their living room, and you see a prominent work of art, it usually says something. It says something about the occupant, about who they are or what they aspire to be. Jean very much identified with this vision world brain. I tried to look for the earliest mention of world brain, and it actually occurs in an unpublished article from 1953. As I go on, you'll see <clears throat> that this was, in fact, very early in his career. But uh, in various relatively early articles, 58, 64, he goes back time and again to this idea of the world brain. So he associates it with the work that he is, himself is doing. Another uh, publication was an article in The Atlantic uh, in 1945 by the Director of Scientific Research of the United States in the Second World War for the um, Army, and his name was Vannevar Bush. <laughs> the essay is called As We May Think. He talks about a mechanical advice, <clears throat> device really built around microfilm uh, that he called Memex, and Memex is short for memory extender. Uh, he says, consider a future device for individual use, which is a sort of mechanical private file and library. It needs a name, and so he calls it Memex. Uh, it stores all a person's books, records, communications, and mechanized so that it may be consulted with exceeding speed and flexibility, enlarged, <coughs> enlarged intimate supplement to his memory. And Gene explicitly wrote about the difference between Memex and World Brain. World Brain meaning the contents, <clears throat> Memex being the mechanism by which the contents are uncovered. So if I go back here, uh, I have a legend. Gene was an information pioneer, he was an un entrepreneur, and he was a visionary. And I, I think we can agree that information pioneer, entrepreneur, their factual statements. Visionary, you might have to argue uh, the reasons why. <clears throat> uh, it seems to me, and I don't know how he did this, that Gene understood or saw in his mind the World Wide Web 40 years before it actually existed. He was imagining these things, and he was searching in his early career for a way to help bring this about. But these two things, World Brain and Memex, were in the background of his thinking. Here are a few other uh, comments, <clears throat> including one by Gene himself, <clears throat> on what he was trying to accomplish early on. One by Henry Small, a longtime colleague. And as you can see, he said that uh, Gene regarded science citation index as a step toward the world brain. And Paul Wooters saying that Gene had a vision for this, and it was not only visionary, but it was idealistic as well. And in fact, Gene, in an early letter when he's trying to develop the Science Citation Index, writes to Joshua Lederberg, the Nobel Prize winner and an early supporter, that I have great faith that the Citation Index will one day be a spur to many new scientific discoveries in the service 
of mankind. So he's a young man with uh, lofty ideals and I think a grand vision. Uh, these are some of the topics that I'd like to cover, each of them rather quickly. Uh, you'll see some of the same slides. It's inevitable, same man. Um, and we'll go through, but this is where uh, I'm headed. <clears throat> the early years. <clears throat> Jean was born September 16th, 1925 in the Bronx. Uh, by the time he was born, his father had left his mother. So he was raised by a single mother. He had a sister who was two years old, uh, two years older than uh, he was. <clears throat> but he had a supportive extended family, especially in the form of five uncles. Uh, two uh, were capitalists and three were Marxists, made for an interesting family. Uh, here's a picture of Gene when he was uh, nine years old. And <clears throat> he grew up in straightened circumstances, let's say, uh, but uh, they got by and he had a very supportive uh, mother. He went to public school in the Bronx. This is his graduation picture from grammar school. He tells a very interesting and I think a revealing story. As a young child, he used to go to the New York Public Library, the local branch, and he would walk through the adult section and he would memorize the titles of the books in the adult section. Uh, in order. Uh, so I always ask myself why he did this. Uh, did he find this uh, a kind of a refuge? Was he just a bright and curious kid? Was he, was he showing off, you know, that he had the ability to memorize all this? But it certainly says something, it's probably all of those, but it certainly says something about his curiosity and his desire to understand and organize information. He graduated from DeWitt Clinton High School in the Bronx in 1942. And then Gene enters what I would call either turbulent years or maybe even wilderness years. It was a very upsetting time for him in, in many ways. He was trying to find his way in the world as many of us when we're young try to do, and making some decisions and then coming to other decisions and going through a lot of different experiences. So after he graduates from high school, he heads out west. He has a kind of romantic vision of the west. He goes to the University of Colorado Boulder, but only, uh, only completes one semester. And for some reason, and it's quite, not quite clear, he, he leaves and he goes to see some relatives in San Francisco. He's uh, maybe 16, 17 at this time. And the war effort is on and he gets a job as a welder at a shipyard in San Francisco. After some time there, he goes back to Colorado. One year, one semester experience at the University of Colorado. Uh, he met his first wife. They were not yet married, but he was going back to spend some time with her. He worked at an inland shipyard in Colorado. They actually made parts of ships, uh, not necessarily on the coast. He was doing that for a while. <clears throat> uh, and then um, he decided that he wanted to uh, join the service and, in fact, the merchant marine. He knew he was getting of age where he might be drafted. So he went back to New York and there was a letter from the draft board and so he was drafted into the army. And he went through uh, a few different uh, uh, assignments in the army including back to Colorado for training perhaps as a, in the, the ski service. But later uh, it was found that he had facility in typing and stenography and other things that he had learned in high school and he became a company clerk. So he was uh, drafted uh, into that service within the army and went to officer training school. And of course the war is reaching an end as we come to 1945 and all of a sudden he's about to be shipped out to the Pacific for the final battles 
of World War II. And lo and behold, Gene is diagnosed with ulcers, and he's discharged. He tells a very funny story. His mother comes down uh, to get him. Uh, he's at, uh, in Maryland when he's discharged. And the doctor says, I'm sorry, but your son has to be discharged because he has ulcers. And his mother starts to cry. And the doctor says, wow, she's a super patriot. She really wanted her son to serve. And in fact, she was crying tears of joy that her son got out of the army. So anyway, that was uh, Gene's experience. And after the army, he went uh, back to find his girlfriend, who was now graduated from the University of Colorado and at the radiation, or she had served at the radiation lab at the University of California, Berkeley. 1945, they got married, and they were both pre-medical students at the University of California, Berkeley. So this period of time, he's having a lot of different experiences. He's exposed to a lot of things. Uh, he was recognized within the Army for his facility to organize and his typing skills and so on. Uh, I, we'll come back to that. <clears throat> the marriage did not last. Uh, his wife wanted to go to medical school, but not at Berkeley. She was accepted at Temple University in Philadelphia. They moved back there, got divorced. But Jean wanted to keep a son that was born named Stefan. This is very unusual in 1947. He wanted to take sole custody of their son, and he did. So now Jean is a single father, no degree, discharged from the army. Uh, his sister Sylvia, pictured there in lower right, is taking care of Stefan. He's driving a cab at night. This is a later version of his uh, cab life license or chauffeur, chauffeur's license from New York City. And you would say that this person doesn't have a lot of prospects. Uh, he's had a lot of experiences, but he doesn't seem to really have found his way. Um, he goes to Columbia University on the GI Bill and <clears throat> by 1949 earns a BS in chemistry. He has one year experience as an assistant in a chemistry lab, a contract chemistry lab called Evans Research and Development. But then his cousin, who happens to be a graduate student of the famous physical organic chemist Louis Hammett, uh, manages to find him a job within Hammett's lab as a research assistant. And so this is where Gene spent uh, one year. Now, again, uh, you'd think that Gene was on the track to some kind of career path, but he ran into some trouble. The trouble is that he kept uh, having accidents in the lab, explosions. So he had a little chat with Hammett, and they both agreed that this was probably not the career for Gene. But the one thing that Gene did while he was in that lab is he discovered a closet full of chemicals that had been synthesized. And there's a mess. Nobody knew what was there. He went through and he organized all of that. He documented what was there and saved a lot of people a lot of work by figuring out what had already been done. So from the New York Public Library, memorizing books in the stacks, to his experience in the Army, uh, a, a good organizer of information. And now in Hammett's lab, a theme begins to build about what his real talent might be. He's looking for a job now because he's no longer working in Hammett's lab. And he decides, uh, well, he's got a job interview at the American Chemical Society annual meeting which was being held in New York in 1951. And he's wandering around and he sees a session on chemical documentation. He has no idea what this is. So he wanders into the meeting and he hears some talks and the moderator of this session is a man named James Perry. He's from MIT and he's sort of the, the, the large figure in this field at this time and this uh, division of ACS was quite new and it was focused on uh, how uh, you could use uh, technology to improve uh, documentation indexing of uh, chemistry and he was an early pioneer 
So at the end of this session, Gene, in his inimitable way, walks up to James Perry and says, how does a guy get a job in this racket? And he starts to talk, and, and Perry is really taken with his enthusiasm and agrees to take Gene on at MIT as a research assistant. And they arrange to meet at another time. But unfortunately, the funding for this position did not come through. And Perry was kind enough to arrange a kind of similar job for Gene at a project that the US Army was running at the Welsh Medical Library at Johns Hopkins University. And there, they were also coping with a, a burgeoning, a fast growing scientific literature, how to manage it, how to index it, how to use technology, perhaps, to do this in a more efficient way. And as it says here, a key objective was to improve the currency of a, a service that the, the, the Army project put out, the Welsh Medical Library put out, called the Current List of Medical Literature, uh, through perhaps machine indexing. So this is where Gene wound up in 1951. And uh, he's written an essay on this. You can go back and see it, uh, as Arun helpfully showed. All of Gene's writings are on his personal website. They're easy to find. So this was his own personal history of the Welsh Medical Library project and his role in it, published in 1985. <clears throat> I would say that uh, these years, 1951 to 1953, when he worked on this pro project, were essential years. From this period, he seemed to get almost every idea that he would spend the rest of his life working out. So it was very a fruitful time for him. In March of 1953, he organized the first symposium on machine methods in scientific documentation. While he was at the Welsh Library, he became known as a punch card guru. He was the person that knew the most about the technology, the machines that could uh, serve to index the literature more quickly, to compile it, to sort it in various ways, to produce indexes more efficiently. <clears throat> they were always wrestling with subject heading categories, uh, which usually took a lot of thought from professional indexers, a very rigorous system that had to be followed exactly. Uh, it was something that really bedeviled uh, the projects. As the literature was mounting, they needed more and more people with this expertise to deal in an intelligent way with indexing uh, uh, the literature using these standard subject headings. So this was always a problem that he was dealing with. This was a, a fantastically successful meeting, and it was really a meeting that Gene himself organized. Over 300 people came. National press attention um, <clears throat> was generated from this meeting. One of the speakers was quoted as saying, mankind is going to drown in a flood of paper. And this was picked up over the wire services and, brought, and so uh, it was in a lot of newspapers all over the United States. And out in Colorado, a man named William Adair, who was an executive <clears throat> of a firm that indexed the legal literature, saw this and wrote a letter. And I'll get, that, get to that contents of that letter in, in just a minute. <clears throat> But again, a change of fortune for Gene. S uh, Sanford Larkey, the head of the Welsh Medical Project, fired Gene. He fired him for, as Gene says, a lot of reasons. But one thing that Gene was doing on his own, kind of entrepreneurially, was <clears throat> making a little booklet of the table of contents of <clears throat> journals in library science and documentation. He wanted himself to be able to keep abreast of the literature in the field that he was drawing on for his own work. And he realized that other people might want this too. Larkey didn't like the idea of him having a, a side interest. And, and there were other reasons uh, as well. But anyway, uh, Larkey uh, fired Gene. And actually, the Welsh Medical Library uh, project of the US Army ended uh, shortly thereafter.
This project, the U.S. Army Library Medical Project, actually was the origin of the National Library of Medicine in the United States. So once again, we find <clears throat> Jean out of a job. But this letter from William Adair, William Adair was a uh, vice president with this organization called Shepherd Citations. And as I said, they indexed the legal literature. Uh, in US uh, law, uh, things move on the basis of precedence. So it's very important for lawyers to know if a previous decision has been overturned. And what Shepherd Citation enabled you to do is to look up a case and to see whether a later case uh, had a negative ruling on the previous case. So Jean didn't know what Shepherd Citation was, but Adair was saying, maybe you should look at this form of indexing for the scientific literature. So Jean went to the local uh, Pratt Library there in, uh, <clears throat> in uh, Baltimore, looked up Shepard citations, and he said he literally had a eureka moment. He saw a method of joining together related papers uh, that was faster than the subject that, that could be more accurate and a faster way of joining things together than the subject heading categories that required so much knowledge of the professional indexers. And I think about this thing, and of course you think about Pasteur's comment, or famous saying, uh, certainly Jean was in a position with all these different experiences to grasp the importance of what Shepard citations was and to see its application in the scientific literature. And that's what Aristotle says, you know, genius is being able to see similarity in dissimilar things. But I just love this quote, <clears throat> which I found uh, by Samuel Johnson. Uh, genius, whatever it be, is like fire in the flint, only to produce by collision with a proper subject. And this is what I think happened to Gene. You know, Gene found the problem that he, it, it, life experience prepared him for. And when he found that, he was able to make this association and it ignited, uh, you, you know, his, his life work. And his life work really centers on the Science Citation Index, now the Web of Science. And his famous paper was published in 1955 in Science <clears throat> Magazine. And <clears throat> I, I want you to note that um, what he calls the citation index, he calls it an association of ideas index. And I'm going to make you dizzy just for a second to go back to this slide uh, of Vannevar Bush and his essay, As We May Think. I forgot to underscore uh, how Vannevar Bush described this Memex system and how the information would be joined together. Wholly new forms of encyclopedias will appear, ready-made, with a mesh of associative trails running through them. So Bush was talking about associative trails, and through citation indexing, Gene saw an association of ideas index. He said, by using author's references in compiling the citation index, we are in reality utilizing an army of indexers. This is the key, this is the big idea. And this was met with not much enthusiasm. Not many people took note. Gene tried to advance this idea in many places, in many ways, and mostly people were skeptical. Um, but in 1959, he got a, a letter, handwritten letter, you can see that on the right, by uh, Joshua Lederberg, who had won the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine the previous year for his work on conjugation of bacteria. And uh, Lederberg wrote, and let me see if I can read it here. Well, I think I can remember it. He says, you know, since you wrote that uh, article a few years back, I've been thinking 
that that is exactly what I need because I have to keep track of literature, and he said, in collateral fields. And he said he was completely sold on the idea and wondered what had happened. So Gene was overwhelmed because nobody was showing any enthusiasm for his idea. So to get a, a, a letter from a Nobel Prize winner was great, greatly encouraging. Joshua Letterberg was associated with our company a, as a board member, a Gene's trusted friend for many years. And here on the left, you can see Gene in one of his classic uh, outfits, bright orange head to toe. And he was so grateful and so admiring of Joshua Letterberg that he in fact named his son, one of his sons, Joshua. And I found this picture of Gene and his son, Joshua. I have no, no idea what they were doing, but I like the picture. And so there you are. <clears throat> and so finally, with the support of Letterberg, who was making connections for Gene at the National Institutes of Health, and through that, uh, they got funding for them to do, uh, for Gene to do, an experimental citation index which would focus on genetics. It came out in 1963, uh, based on 1961 data, and it was enough to demonstrate uh, that, that it would work, that it was viable, uh, both functionally and economically. And in fact, in 1964, uh, the first commercially available uh, science citation index came out. So the science citation index covered all fields. The, the uh, prototype focusing on genetics was multidisciplinary enough in terms of showing uh, that if you index uh, journals that were thought to be genetics, you could look at what they cited, uh, what cited them in some sense, and then you could uh, see that a citation index would be an efficient information retrieval system. So what are the benefits of citation indexing? I'm sure many people here in the room know, but let me just reiterate it. It's the ability, just like in the legal literature, of searching forward in time. From a known reference, you could see what was published later that depended upon the earlier publication or that cited it, so that you could use footnotes or cited references in the literature, not just to go backward, but to go forward in time. Another uh, value of citation indexing was its accur accuracy and its precision. Why? Because the citations were made, uh, carefully chosen by the experts themselves. So it wasn't professional an uh, indexers who were picking particular subject headings or descriptors to associate one article with another. It was the people who wrote the articles themselves. They were in the best position to be able to indicate what things were connected to one another. Uh, and that citation index could, as Gene said, break the subject index barrier. Because before this time, there were a lot of subject-specific databases for biology, for chemistry, for engineering and technology, but there was no one database that put everything together. Everything together, everything together like a world brain. And then, of course, Gene appreciated, although there were many technical problems to work out, not beyond him, uh, the speed in being able to index information through uh, capturing the references. So over time, uh, the citation index went through many uh, incarnations. Of course, it first came out in printed form. Then SciSearch was an online form. You could dial it up through a, a service called Dialog that you might remember, or many other kind of online services. Um, as technology advanced, Gene adapted uh, the index and many other products for those technologies, or he made, uh, he exploited those technologies at each step. So uh, we found uh, versions of different products migrating over to uh, uh, real to real tape or online service dial up services to floppy disks to CD ROMs, and finally in the 90s to the uh, World Wide Web. So in 1997, Science Citation Index and other citation indexes 
uh, were migrated to the web as the web of science. Jean was always, always up to date with technology. In 1992 or 93, I used to have an office right across from the, his office. And he called me into his office and he showed me something. He showed me Mosaic and Netscape, you know, the early versions of the internet. And he told me that this is where things, and, and I, I, you know, who should have known? I should have known, but he knew. He was always up to date. So while all of this was going on, while he was trying to whip up enthusiasm for a citation index for science, uh, he was supporting himself in another way, and that's current contents. Remember contents in advance, the thing that got him fired from the Hop Johns Hopkins project? Uh, that table of contents service. He, f he, he did it first for library science and the documentation. Then he did it for management. This is the 50s now. And he did it for um, pharmaceutical companies, for the life sciences. And this began to become very popular. He was sort of doing it as a consultant on the side on a contract basis. He was doing a management version for Bell Labs. He was doing a pharmacology life science version for SmithKline French Labs in Philadelphia. Uh, so now he's relocated to the Philadelphia area and living in New Jersey, in a place called Thoroughfare, New Jersey. And this is the famous building where ISI really began. Uh, it is or was a chicken coop, but he converted it into an office. And this is a place where he actually created, xerographically, I guess it was at the time, these pages, reduced size pages of table and contents to produce, uh, well, this is a later version called current contents. The management version was first called management documentation preview. And then somebody advised him that that wasn't the catchiest name and he came onto current contents. And then there was a current contents version custom made for Smith Klein and French laboratories. But eventually this evolved. So there was a life sciences version, and then there was a physical sciences version. And this slide shows you over time how the different editions of current contents came about. And this really was the basis, the funding for all of his activities, because he could not have started the science citation index without the revenue that was being generated from current contents. And I should just say here that Gene was not really focused in the mid-50s on being a, an entrepreneur or going into business or even publishing the Science Citation Index himself. He was trying to get government agencies in, interested in making a citation index. He, w while he was making current contents, he was studying for a PhD in structural linguistics which he had gotten in 1961 at the University of Pennsylvania. So he actually had an academic uh, career in mind, but in order to do the things that he wanted or to have the information that he himself needed, he, he, he had no uh, recourse but to make these things himself. And he was more than a little bit of a risk taker, so he took these things on. And uh, Arun has already stated that over the years, he wrote these famous essays in the front matter of current contents, uh, eventually to become uh, called current comments, on every topic that imaginable. When he introduced a new product or he wanted to describe one of his products, there would certainly be an essay about that. But anything that began to interest him, he would have his researchers, I was one of them, um, look into it compile information for him using our own data, our own database, and then he would work on an essay about that. Uh, uh, so you were right, there are over a thousand of them. 32 years wor worth of uh, essays and they're all on online. So we've talked about uh, citation indexes, uh, we've talked about uh, current contents, and now I'd like to talk about the citation data 
for the history and the sociology of science, something that he was interested in very early on, even when he didn't even have a full year of the Science Citation Index. He was talking to Letterberg in 1962 while he was doing the prototype of the Genetic Citation Index and also the Science Citation Index developing that. He, for the first time, met the sociologist of science, Robert Merton. He met Derek DeSola Price. You've mentioned both of them. Uh, Merton um, was really the, the, the father of the sociology of science uh, in the US. Uh, Derek DeSola Price was a physicist by training and uh, a historian of science who was very interested in quantifying uh, the growth of science, turning the the tools of science on science itself, to study the process of science itself. In 1964, uh, Jean and two colleagues wrote a paper under contract for the U.S. Office, uh, United States Air Force Office of Scientific Research, and it had this arresting uh, first sentence in it. Can a computer write the history of science? And what he did is he looked at direct citation linkages Remember, he didn't have very much citation data to look at. He was only looking at the 1961, uh, one year's worth of uh, uh, data that he was looking at. And he decided to compare what um, the direct citations in the, uh, that, that he could see in the data said about the history of DNA research as compared to a recently published book on um, the history of DNA by Isaac Asimov, a kind of a popular science writer. And this is right after the Nobel Prize, uh, Watson and Crick as well. And so he compared the two and made these overlay maps of what the citation data said and what uh, the historian, in this case Asimov, said about the developments, the important developments of the field and the key papers. And his uh, conclusion was that citation analysis can be demonstrated to be a val valid and valuable means of creating accurate historical descriptions of scientific fields. I just want to make note here that Gene very early on is interested not only in using the citation data for information retrieval, but to reveal something about the process of science itself and its history. And another dimension of the process of science and the history of science is the sociology of science. And in this case, his friend uh, Robert Merton was an uh, uh, instrumental advisor. And Robert Merton was known for the so-called normative theory of uh, scientific conduct and behavior, one aspect of which are that citations are the way that one researcher repays the debt they have, the intellectual debt they have to another researcher. And that uh, there's a formal nature of citing in the literature, and there's also a moral imperative to cite. So when you think about citation in the context of you know, Mertonian ideas, you understand how it might be useful, not only in accurately tracing influence in terms of history of science, but also revealing something about the social structure and stratification of, of science. Now, there are certainly alternative views of theories of citation, including uh, that uh, you know, citations are used uh, as rhetorical devices for making arguments. There's a whole school uh, known under various names, but one is the constructivists that think that citations and knowledge within science is a wholly social convention. And I would say that most definitely, you know, the thinking at ISI over the years was not of that school. We were certainly within the Mertonian uh, school of, of thought. And Merton became very interested in using the citation database for his own studies and those of his students. And he started a seminar in the sociology of science at Columbia uh, in the 1960s. And many quite well-known uh, sociologists of science, the brothers Stephen and Jonathan Cole, uh, Harriet Zuckerman, Diana Crane, uh, 
Lowell Hargens, many of these uh, uh, people in the second generation after Merton, students of Merton, looked at and made use of citation data. I'm not talking here about performance analysis. I'm talking here about understanding communication networks, hierarchy, and social structure. So this is another realm in which citation information was applied and in which Gene himself expressed a lot of interest. And while we're talking about the sociology of science and the history of science, I can't help but talk about this week's citation classic, which I think was one of the most interesting activities that we did at, e at ISI. We would find highly cited papers. We would write to the authors of those papers and ask them to write an autobiographical commentary. How did this paper come to be? What difficulties did you have in doing this research or getting it published? Tell us the story behind the formal publication. And this was often extremely uh, interesting and revealing of how science really happened. As Jean says, this is the human side of science. And in this case, we have a commentary not on a paper but a book, The Nature of the Chemical Bond, which was written uh, by Linus Pauling. We were fortunate to get this before he passed away. <clears throat> I'd like to turn to another application of citation data, and that is in <clears throat> mapping the structure and the dynamics of research. <clears throat> and Derek Price was a pioneer in this regard. <clears throat> and he was very early on uh, thinking that the scientific literature could somehow reveal the structure of uh, uh, the organic structure of science itself that, that let me see, what, what's the language he used? He used perfect language. There is some type of natural order in science crying out to be recognized and diagnosed, he said. If we can successfully define the natural order, we will have created a sort of giant atlas of the corpus of scientific papers that can be maintained in real time for classifying and monitoring developments as they occur. And in a famous 1965 paper called Networks of Scientific Papers, he used a small group of papers, 200 papers, on something called NRAIS, which turned out to not be anything, but at a moment in time was quite interesting in physics. And he showed how, over the course of publication of these papers, something called a, which he called a research front developed where, and that's what's in green here, that <clears throat> uh, current papers rely on other current papers. And he saw this as the leading edge, uh, maybe the coal, you could call it the coal face. And he was very interested in using publications and citations and the ISI data to define these research fronts or the, the, the front edge of, of science. But um, there were some technical problems and wasn't quite sure how to do that. And Henry Small in 1972 joined ISI. Uh, he was a historian of science. And he imagined using citations in a particular way to define specialty structure. Uh, instead of direct citations, as in Gene's 1964 paper for the Air Force on the history of DNA, he imagined this idea called co-citation. If two papers were frequently cited in pairs, then that's a strong signal from the citing scientists that they belong together. So that's what we have in the top here, number one. A and B are frequently cited together. They're likely uh, closely related. But if we have many pub publications that cite a lot of different papers in pairs, we begin to form a cluster of papers that seem to be related. And these clusters, Henry called, research fronts. And they were really the further uh, revelation of what Price was trying to do. And this is a very early research front map in biomedicine from 1973, put together by Henry and his colleague, Belver Griffith. And as in many things, you know, Gene wanted to make products out of the research that we were doing at the company. And so in 1981 and 19, uh, 1983, 
he published these two large, thick books called the ISI Atlas of Science in different areas in the biomedical fields. And he was very enthusiastic about this. <clears throat> but uh, once again, the marketplace was not so enthusiastic about it. Gene kept trying products. Whatever would interest him, he, he would do. Uh, he was not as much interested in money as he was interested in ideas and getting the most out of all this work that he was doing, the information that he and all of his colleagues were so uh, <laughs> interested in. ISI Atlas of Science didn't do well as a product in that form, and in the late 80s, he turned it into a set of review journals. But uh, by the end of the, the decade, in the 80s, he was selling his interest in the company and the people who bought it stopped certain products, including the Atlas of Science. Finally, technology in the late 90s and early 2000s kept advanced to the point where science mapping could be done more easily by more people. You didn't need uh, all the data uh, that we had internally to do that. You could access it. In, uh, storage on a PC was sufficient. People were writing their own software. So now there are many academic departments engaged in the mapping of science. And this book, ca interestingly called Atlas of Science, was published by an Indiana University information science professor, Kati Borner, and she took the name Atlas of Science. So now this is a mature and a robust field. Uh, so much so that the Japanese government is using science mapping to make policy choices and funding choices. And they have come to the conclusion after studying their science maps based upon our data over a decade and a half that they're much too conservative about the projects that they fund and uh, that they are slow to engage in these, these cutting edge areas. So it's uh, gratifying, and Gene knew about this, that uh, science mapping has reached a, a maturity I think that this is still underutilized by, by government uh, agencies. The interest in the monitoring, the, the structure and the dynamics of science in order to inform policy choices and funding choices. Uh, I think it's, 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 it, it will gain more and more, more traction now. The journal impact factor, you know, the thing everybody likes to talk about. Uh, let me just say, uh, I'm sure you all know what the journal impact factor is. It's a, a measure of short-term average influence of a journal. Citations in one year to papers published in a journal in the previous two years, divided by the number of substantive papers in the journal in the previous two years. Not the letters, not the editorials, not the meeting abstracts, uh, the, the, the regular reports, as it were. And, uh, Gene developed this and released it as a product in the mid-70s, but he was working with his colleague Irv Schur on this uh, throughout the 60s. Why did he do this? Why did he make a measure of journal influence? So he would know what journals to index for the science index. He couldn't index everything. It was not economically possible. We didn't have the capacity to do that, but he wanted to make sure that he got the most influential uh, journals, those that were the most used. Uh, and this is a classic 80-20 distribution where 20% of uh, you know, the population has 80% of the influence. He wanted to make sure he was indexing the internationally influential journals. Now, <clears throat> before I came, uh, I, I'm on this listserv uh, for Sigmetrics, people interested in the, the kind of work that we do. And this is from a Spanish researcher, outraged that the Spanish government, health-related institutions and funders, are using derived indicators like impact factor global, adding all the IF values of journals, or average impact factor to evaluate which projects get funded. So, you know, you've got a bibliography of a researcher and you look at the impact factors of all the journals and you simply add them up, you come to a number. I mean, this is completely ridiculous. Uh, different fields have different average rates of citation. You know, there's no 
uh, guarantee that any, uh, any paper published in any journal will have uh, anywhere near the citation of the, or the influence of the journal itself, uh, citation distributions are highly skewed. Uh, if you, the, the journal impact factor is a mean, so most things are gonna fall below that mean. I, I mean, this is all craziness that you would use a proxy like the impact factor to predict the rate of citation for an individual paper. Just go up, look, how many times has the paper actually been cited? That's the way to gauge the influence or impact of the citation. So he's saying, as people have said time and time again, can't somebody do something about this? You know, either the professional society, uh, ISSI, or Clarivate, us, you know, what can we do? Um, Gene was constantly, constantly traveling and trying to educate people on the proper use of uh, citation data. Uh, but, you know, we really can't control how, how it's used, un unfortunately. So, time and again, you know, we would be reading these editorials. I'm sure you've all read them too. Here's one in Nature Cell Biology in 2014. And end the tyranny of the impact factor, you know? And, and meanwhile, nature itself is advertising its impact factor. Uh, Gene wrote about this all, all the time, you know, the agony and the ecstasy, the meaning of the impact factor. But, um, you know, as I said, we, we've had some problems in uh, helping people understand it, its, its proper use. It's a measure for journals. You know, really, Gene was interested in understanding the overall structure of the journal literature, rather the pecking order of any particular journal. This is the way he organized the information and made the product. But the emphasis was not, in his own mind, not so much on ranking as on understanding a system, how one journals uh, relate to one another. So if you look at the journal citation reports, it's got a wealth of data on uh, intercitations between journals within a field, across fields. Over time, he's got the half-life of journal. Nobody pays attention to this data, really. They're only looking at impact factor scores and rankings. So that leads us to the discussion of citation data for research evaluation. And, and why would we think about using the data for this purpose? Well, you know, peer review is the way science is judged. Uh, people get appointments or promotions. Uh, funding decisions are made. Peer review is usually small scale, ground up. Uh, it depends upon absolute counts. Uh, size certainly uh, colors perception. Um, when you think about the best work or you're reviewing uh, the work, you might think of work that's rather old, you know, maybe you encountered it when 10 years ago, and that, that affects your, your judgment. Publication and citation data is more top-down. Uh, you can make relative or weighted measures, and if you only look at a recent period, you can sort of cut the past off and the impression that the past might give you. So you would think, and again, relying on these Mertonian norms, that there is meaning uh, and validity to the citations and the number of citations that people make, the informed experts make in their papers, that you might be able to use citation analysis in a way to balance peer review or to supplement peer review. But Gene would always say, only in certain cases, only under certain circumstances would you do that. There are many circumstances where it doesn't work. It's not applicable. Humanities research, for instance. Many uh, fields in the social sciences. It's a question of coverage in the web of science or the science citation index. Uh, there are certain realms of science maybe important regionally, uh, not in the international influential journals we cover. So our coverage might not be enough. So this is what Gene meant about making a careful decision whether you have adequate data even to consider supplementing peer review uh, through citation data. But this is the notion, you know. This is to, to take quantitative measures and to add them to qualitative measures, maybe for in more informed decision making. Uh, 
So, you know, we used to be Thompson before we were Clarivate. And so I used to go around and I used to use this famous quote, the Kelvin dictum, to say why we were, we were doing this work in terms of measurement of science. If you can measure that of which you speak and can express it by a number, you know something of your subject, but if you cannot measure it, your knowledge is meager and unsatisfactory. Okay, well, that's the argument for quantification, right? Well, here are two University of Chicago economists who have a different take. And uh, Viner, Jacob Viner says, when you can measure it, when you can express it in numbers, your knowledge is still of a meager and unsatisfactory kind. And his colleague, Frank Knight, said, if you cannot measure a thing, go ahead and measure it anyway. And so some people, I think, think about bibliometrics in this, in this way, you know, that we're less at the top, quote, and more at the bottom quote, you know, you really can't measure, but you guys are going ahead and measuring it anyway. And so uh, they sort of accuse us of this sort of uh, numerology, I would say, or pseudoscience, something like this. And, and gee, I, I hope, I hope we're, we're not this bad. But I have to say, you know, when I look at university rankings and I see how they're constructed, you know, what indicators are chosen, what weightings are given to the different indicators. There's no scientific basis for this at all. It's all a matter of preferences. And each university ranking is different from the others. And each weighting is different from the others. And then sometimes even an individual university ranking decides to change their methodology the next year and change a weighting and it's remarkable how the rankings change drastically. So you don't even have any time series to look at. And when I look at this sign and I think about some of the work in terms of university rankings, I think we're getting close to this. So uh, I'm concerned myself, as Gene would be, about the implications, the applications of, of some bibliometrics, not just in the individual sphere and the impact factors, uh, but at uh, the university level again. All right, so here's some basics. Publications as indicators of output, citations as indicators of influence. Cites per paper, weighted influence, that makes sense. It's a size uh, independent measure. Relative indicators, because of course different fields have different average rates of citation and older papers have more time to be cited than younger. We have a skewed distribution. Percentiles would be very helpful for knowing where on the distribution a particular paper or group of papers would be. And more and more, there's interest at the top end. You know, of the output produced, what percentage is at the influential end of that distribution? But then, you know, and this is less helpful in, in, in my uh, impression, and in, in Gene's uh, impression certainly it was, uh, these single measures that are composite measures of different things like the H index, and certainly the misuse of journal impact factors. I want to emphasize that this performance evaluation was the thing that Gene was least interested in. The first and foremost thing that people now seem to forget is citation indexing for information retrieval. Then his interest was for the history of sociology and science. Then the structure and dynamics of science. And finally, lastly, it was using it for performance measurement. Did he think that it shouldn't be used for performance measurement? No, he thought it did have applications in particular ways. In terms of national performance comparisons, yes, some uh, institutional performance, yes. By the time you got to comparing individuals, it becomes very tricky. But this was not Gene's main focus. And he talked about different things, even performance analysis uh, going back. Here's a 1963 paper. He's been this is the paper where he's first talking about the impact factor in comparing journals. And he's talking about journals, and then he says, on the other hand, this same information should be used with caution for personnel selection and evaluation. And he says, by Nobel committees. He hadn't done his work yet on uh, Nobel Prizes. And at the end he said, 
Uh, if time were available, we could demonstrate how one might use the citation networks for extremely interesting historical and sociology. So again, he's shifting the focus back to a deeper problem. You know, he's saying that look, there's a lot of interest in using this to evaluate people, but that's not the best use. It, it's more interesting here. And, and what I want to say on Gene's behalf in terms of evaluating individuals is this famous phrase, you know, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. So Gene, by inviting those people to write those citation classic commentaries, wanted to highlight influential work and the authors of influential work. So he saw citation in, high, in, in quantity, high frequency, meaningful and, and reliable. Uh, but we're talking about very high frequency. Uh, the absence of citations, however, could not be interpreted as no influence. And, and I think this is what has been missed. You, you know, if, if somebody has a paper with thousands of citations, that's, on the face of it, pretty good evidence that there has been some kind of impact. But because a, a, a work or an individual seems to have a relatively low number of citations, that is not evidence for no significance, no impact, you know, no value, obviously. Uh, he was concerned, we're all concerned about formulaic use of citation data and its negative effects and how it can change behaviors and how in the reward system of science, if people, institutions, government funding agencies start to focus on the scores that people will chase the scores and they'll stop doing science. And this is not the purpose at all of uh, using citation data for analysis. Um, there are famous laws, Campbell's Law, Goodhart's Law. Campbell's Law, the more any quantitative social indicator is used for social decision making, the more subject it will be to corruption pressures and the more apt it will be to distort and corrupt the social processes it is intent to monitor. And I'm afraid that's going on more and more. Uh, Arun mentioned that uh, Gene was also interested in uh, making a newspaper for scientists. So Gene had a role not only as an innovator in terms of scientific information itself, but he, in being a science communicator and a publisher. Uh, this was something he started in 1986, and I was involved with him in starting this. Uh, it's one of the things, frankly, that got him into uh, trouble. He was convinced that he should do this. It took a lot of resources, as did the Atlas of Science. And at the end, it was hard to afford uh, everything. Uh, Hist site, this work that he did long ago in 1964, he was able to come back to in his retirement. And he commercially released uh, Hist site, a software program for making these maps in 2006. Now, I'll quickly turn to Gene's associations with India and there just say a few things. Other people will say more. Here's somebody that we may know talking to Gene and you're telling me, Arun, this was not 1975. This was later. Yeah. But Gene's first visit and visit here was in 1975. And um, Arun showed uh, a picture of this famous mosaic in the old ISI building called Cathedral of Man. And uh, there's a tile there for Raghunathan. <clears throat> and Jean wrote this two-part essay on, uh, he called the father of Indian library scientist, and actually had met Raghunathan in 1957, was it? In England, yep. And uh, so Jean had great regard for um, the tradition of librarianship here in India and for Raghunathan's work. And I think um, you also mentioned the work of uh, Nath Day on cholera. And this, uh, this wonderful, wonderful quote here from Josh Lederberg that I just wanted to read. Our appreciation of Day must then extend beyond the humanitarian consequences of his discovery. He is also an exemplar an inspiration for a boldness of challenge to the established wisdom, a style of thought that should be more aggressively taught, 
by example as well as precept. And I, I think it was probably Josh Lederberg who introduced Gene and encouraged him to write this essay about, um, about this work. So this is a very quick summary of many aspects of Gene. And uh, I hope that you could see uh, the range of interests that he had, uh, interests and experiences. His determination to fulfill uh, these ideas that he first had back in 1951 through 1953. Um, so he had this vision of world brain and that his activities were moving toward that, but he did a lot to bring it into fruition himself. And in that sense, it was a self-fulfilling prophecy, which is an expression that his friend Merton coined, in fact. Uh, so G, you know, helped fulfill his own prophecy in, in terms of information, the availability of information, uh, its ubiquity, and he lived to see uh, it implemented in the World Wide Web. And as you may know, uh, the Google search algorithm, Google search, the patent for that, the PageRank algorithm, actually cites one of Gene's uh, papers. And, and finally now, I'd like to say a few more personal things about Gene as an employer, a mentor, a benefactor, and what I call his uh, personal impact factor. Gene was beloved of his employees. Um, it is very significant to me, uh, aside from all these professional accomplishments, that Gene employed so many people. You know, he gave livelihood and opportunity to thousands. Um, in our company, uh, maybe even half were African American. Uh, many of our top executives were women. He never really considered anything other than the person. He, he engaged with people for who they were, and he gave people tremendous opportunity and support. Gene loved to have parties. We had all kinds of parties celebrating employees, five year, 10 year, 20 year anniversary. Um, he was always accessible. Uh, when employees ran into trouble, he was always there to help uh, emotionally, uh, financially. He was just a, a really wonderful person. And, you know, I have had a, a 35 year career because of uh, Gene Garfield. My entire uh, life has been uh, spent, uh, working life has spent doing this. I was a refugee from the humanities. I had been recently married in 1982. I thought, okay, well, while I finish my dissertation, ancient history, uh, I, I'll get this job, overdeveloped sense of responsibility. I got to ISI, I started to work with Gene, and I never looked back, you know. Uh, it was so interesting, and so for me personally, uh, it was a great uh, opportunity and very fulfilling. But um, to get even more personal, um, my, my wife uh, went to medical school. She decided to go to medical school rather late in life, in her 30s. And uh, because she made that decision and because I had this good career working with Jean, she was able to do that. And she became a psychiatrist. And she, in turn, helped hundreds, if not thousands, of people. Um, uh, she passed away two years ago from pancreatic cancer, quite suddenly. Uh, but she had this medical career. And she helped all these people because you know, of, of my employment with Jean and the opportunity Jean gave me. And people have come up to me and said, you know, your wife saved my life. So Gene, I think of Gene and his influence as like a pebble you drop in a lake or a pond. And you have these rings that go out and they touch more and more people. So all these thousands of people that he employed at ISI, you know, they had family members who were supported and they had members. 
And so Gene's effect personally on so many people, apart from his professional uh, accomplishments, were tremendously great. He was a mentor to many. He was so devoted to his employees that after he built that big building, he built a child care center in the back, and he subsidized it. Now, this is probably his own experience. Uh, you know, he was the child of a single mother. He was a single father and having a struggle with where to put his son, Stefan. Fortunately, he had his sister, Sylvia, to help him. So he invested in his employees. He tried to help them with this beautiful child care center, and it was the best one in Philadelphia. Gene had many, many parts to his personality. You know, as you see in the upper left, he was a scholar. Uh, in the lower right, you might read on his face some of the struggles and burdens he had, you know, as uh, somebody uh, doing many, many things, supporting many people, uh, having lots of ideas, having to run a business too. In the middle, the color picture is a more exuberant uh, gene. He loved the color orange. He wore it well. Um, and the lower right is a picture that I, I look at and I think, well, Here's a clear-eyed person who's comfortable in his own skin. He knows what he wants to do. And at the top, his favorite dog, Pookie. You know, people didn't realize what a sensitive guy uh, Gene was, too. Uh, this is how I remember Gene in his later years at home in his study. Uh, here's a wonderful picture of Gene. Here's a quote that I think says a lot or reminds me of Gene uh, by Count Vignet, uh, French poet, a fine life is a thought conceived in youth and realized in maturity. And, and I think that was Gene's life. Uh, and fortunately, as I said, he lived long enough to see many people uh, give him appreciation for what he did accomplish and contribute. Uh, as you can see, the caption to that is Gene giving one of his warm hugs. Now, after Gene passed away, his wife Meher was going through some papers and she found this and she sent this to me and she said, look what I found. Um, it says, don't mourn for me when I am dead. Mourn for others living tortured lives instead. What we shared cannot be replaced, but having shared it, the future can be faced. We go from day to day, we laugh, we smile. We work at living, doing, yet all the while, we ask if life's a short-lived shout or is loving what it's all about. And she searched and I searched and we didn't find this anywhere on the web and with the crossing out, we're pretty sure that this is an original uh, Gene Garfield poem and I think it says a lot about the man. And uh, I'll miss him very much. Uh, thank you. <laughs>